Hey guys, this is Shane and welcome to my Curator of the Lost channel. Today, hey, I want to talk about how you find and pick books that are going to be profitable for you for resale. Give you some insight to what I do, things that help me. I, I did a video on this, um, one of the earliest videos I did when I first started doing YouTube videos a couple years ago, and it's got lots of views. I thought, hey, got new, new, um, New viewers, let's let's refresh this. Let's touch base on it again, right? It's 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 a topic that every so often I think it's really good to to you know are we still learning, right? And to 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 revisit that topic. So that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, things that I do that um, you know what tips that based on what how what succeeds for me to for you to think about if you're you know if you've been doing it a while, or, you know maybe it'll help. If you're new, hopefully it'll definitely help. So. Um, you know, I'll assume here that you already have a sourcing location. You're, you've got places you can find books. You know, it's the typical culprits, thrift stores, estate sales, your libraries, even yard sales, antique stores. Some people will hit, some people do Facebook marketplace, but you've got a book source, right? You're, you got a place that you have found to source books. And now you're just looking at, Hey, how can I improve my picking? Right. And you know, there's, there's one method, one school of thought is that you would, you just, you get a scanner and you scan every book and there's nothing wrong with that. There's people that do that and they're very successful. And I don't, you know, it's not to me, it's, it's not an us and them thing. It's a, what's the best tool in your toolbox. When I first started selling books, I did not use a scanner at all. Everything was completely with my uh, Mach 1 calibrated eyeball. And it's still 70, 75% that I don't scan every book, but I do employ a scanner using Scout IQ on my phone to help with price comps. And it really helps me with price comps on deciding if I'm sending something to Amazon or eBay. I've, traditionally, if you're, if you're new to the channel, eBay seller for over 20, 20 years, you know, and but then in the last year and a half or so, I've started doing books on Amazon too. And the scanners help me on, on that. But I still, I don't scan everything. I do a hybrid approach where I'm going in and, you know, like, it's like my cat monster when he's going outside, he, you know, he, he don't just rush right. He has to get the lay of the land and kind of, you know, see what's going on out there before he uh, jumps right into the outside. I do that when a bookstore, you know, you got to go in and fill out where the sections are and decide your strategy. Right. And my strategy is, is based on my eyeball because I don't scan everything. I go through and I look at interesting things, things that I think will be good. And then I'll, I'll use the scanner for comps and you know, Hey, that's what I do. Some people don't like to scan at all. Some people say scan everything. I'm kind of in the middle. It's hybrid. It's I use the scanner and my eyeball and my brain. That's the main thing, right? Your experience. So with that, you know, how do you, if you're not using a scanner to scan everything and you're kind of doing a hybrid approach or you're just doing it by eye, what can you do to, to improve your book selecting, picking, uh, finding game, right? And the answer is, is really, I have some guidelines, but the answer boils down eventually to your knowledge, right? You, you, you're always learning. And, you know, I will say that learning individual book titles, it's good if there's some great ones out there, but in general, what you want to do is you want to learn about genres and we're going to go over genres some here in a second, but, you know, specific genres and types of things that sell good work for me. Um, but before I get to that, what, what I always do, I concentrate on nonfiction, nonfiction hardback. That's what I specialize in and it works really good for me. Can you make money selling fiction paperbacks? Absolutely. There's people that do that. Uh, for me, it's just not, maybe it's the books in my area. It's the profit margin that I see. I'm not saying that you can't do that. It's, it's, there's not, everything I say is a grain of salt, right? It's what works for me that I'm offering to you for consideration to improve your game. Um, I concentrate on hardback nonfiction. So when I go into a thrift store, bookstore, library, bookstore, whatever, you know, or even just going through things at an estate sale, you know, if it's James Patterson, John Grisham, da, 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 you know, I'm just, unless I just recognize it as an early first edition I'm just, I'm not even wasting my time on that. I just, that's to me, it's like the, you know, you're trying to find the wheat, not the chaff. And that, that's just the stuff that obscures value, all these mass market type things. And a lot of those are, 
in the fiction category. So I just, I typically just blow through those. I don't even think about it. An exception on that could be like some early, like especially early and even some in the 90s, first edition Stephen King's. I always look for those. They're really good. Um, but that's just me. Fiction, fiction is kind of secondary for me. I'm, I'm mainly a nonfiction hardback bookseller. It works for me. I would suggest that if you're having trouble going into places and kind of like, um, you, know, you just get overwhelmed, think about it in that terms, right? Forget all the mass market, you know, stuff and, and concentrate on those two things. Another thing that I look for, and I've mentioned this multiple times, if you've, if you've watched my videos for any length of time, when I'm scanning the shelves, you know, books are, are lined up, you know, I look at the publishers as well. All right. In this case, see, these are Bonanza and then this one, I don't know, M, M Quup. I mean, these are not your big, like random houses and the big well-known publishers. I look for small publishers. That's something to me that says it's more unique. It's niche. It's, it's weird, right? This is in my, my cool factor. Weird is good. The weirder something is, the more likely it's, I'm going to buy it. Um, sometimes you'll, what you'll see are these end up being different university presses. It's not a guarantee, but if it's a university press, I have good success with those. And it's something that helps me separate, right? So, so I go into a place, I'm looking for nonfiction, hardback, I'm looking at, at weird titles and weird subject matter and small, you know, non-big presses. Those are the types of things that, you know, publishers, those are the types of things I'm going to pull first. Does that mean I'm not going to pull a fiction or a paperback or something from Random House? No, it's just, if I'm thinking about the priority in my mind, that's where I go and help to kind of organize sometimes the chaos, right? Um, but the, the biggest thing after that is I have learned genre over time. Okay. I know very few individual book titles. There's nothing wrong with, you know, but there's so many books out there. Obviously there's books I've sold before. I remember the titles, I'll recognize them. But if I had to write the titles out now, I don't readily remember it. Right. What I concentrate on are genre, the types of things that I think that people are interested in buying and that serves me well. So, and that's where I try, always try to increase my knowledge. Okay. So let's just go through some examples of those genres. And I think, you know, maybe, you know, keeping in mind, you know, my tips so far would be to concentrate on hardback nonfiction, always be alert for small publishers or independent publishers, university presses, and then let's learn genre and get smart on that. So let's just, just talk some examples on genre. Okay. So one thing that I enjoy selling, and I'm, I tell you, I've had some great, great sales on this, is what I would call town, city, county, even state history. Like, so here's one I hadn't sold yet, but it's this sub pulled some examples, this pictorial history of Lawrence, Douglas County, Kansas. So what I like about these, you know, is there, it, it can tag different, um, it's got genre, it's history, it, but it's also local history with, you know, towns and cities, but it also can have this genealogy flair, right? Where people maybe are from that, their family history. So that's another thing that I like when you buy books, get stuff that if you can get stuff that goes into multiple different genres, multiple different classes of styles or subject matter, it can be a big benefit, right? So I would say that, you know, something that I always look for, if they're there, I'm going to, I'm going to try to find them. I'm going to try to buy them. It's going to be town and different town and state and county histories and things with a genealogy flair. Okay. So that's, that's one genre tip that I would give you. Another one that I would give you is on, I'll, I'll say collectibles, collecting, okay? Like here's one, Will and Banjo Barometers, you know? This was, it's just it's just a weird subject matter. How I don't know how many people do collect these, but it's weird. And this one was like a, a UK publisher. I think it had, um, you know, the, gave you the price in pounds there. So that was good. Here's another one uh, in terms of kind of collectibles, but really more maybe like hobbies. Hobbies is another genre, but like 
coin collecting, you know, coins of the Byzantine Empire. So those kinds of things, you know, collectibles and hobbies. Okay, so, you know, that's two, two genres I look at. Okay, here's one that's kind of generic. Eastern Press Books, these leather, if you're not familiar with them, you know, they're, and I'll do something, you know, they're nice. They've got, you know, you'll see Eastern Press. Uh, what I always like to do though, see how this is in there? Some people, when they get these, they fill them out and it's their, you know, their personal library and they'll stick them in there and they're stuck. I definitely don't like that because it'll ruin, to me, it ruins the book that's collectible. But Eastern Presses, there's other ones like this, like Franklin Library, but Easton's kind of like cream of the crop. Don't overpay for these. If I can get them for five bucks or less, I buy them all day long. They usually will sell in that 20, 30, 40, even higher, depending on the thing. So it's always something to be on the lookout for, the beautiful Easton presses. I like them better than the Franklin Library stuff. I don't have much success with the Franklin Library, but the Easton's good, okay? Um, animals. I always look for weird dog books, horse books, um, beekeeping. Always have good success with beekeeping. Anything I find with bees, always check it out. So that's that's a good one. Um, here's fiction. One fiction thing I love, and you guys, if you've been around me, whenever I find Warhammer books, Warhammer 40K, especially the large editions, like beautiful art, great stories, big following, get them at the right price. And, and I guess that's one thing I would say is always price dominates everything, right? You have to get things at the right price, but Warhammer, great, great genre to remember. Um, trains, railroad, transportation. So this, uh, trains are great. Uh, in the transfer, transportation things, if I see things from like British, you know, you know, British or Italian, you know, you know, sports cars, the, you know, we're talking like, you know, cars that are in the class of like the Ferraris, the Porsches, the, the Bentleys, the Rolls Royces, you know, a lot of those, even like old Corvettes, things of that nature, you know, there's, it could just be books on them, you know, that are kind of classic, but it can also be the repair manuals. Okay. This is like for a Toyota. This is like the OEM kind of repair manual. Now, there are, there is value in the, you know, some of the Climber and Chilton manuals, but when you can get the OEM manuals like that, it's, you know, a lot of times those are big dollars, sometimes, you know, a hundred bucks a piece. So that's good. Um, here's any kind of like uh, training manuals, right? Um, it could be for studying for different exams. I mean, like, like especially technical exams, Things like in the construction, manufacturing industries. This is one for civil engineering. Um, I always look for those. I look to see that they're not used. That's a bonus. Um, you know, other things kind of in that construction industry. You've got things like uh, anything with steel or concrete construction manuals. I always look at those. They're good. Um, a different thing is uh, here... This is something I always, I've sold several of these, but this is an example from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Facsimile copies of things. So they'll be like old book, like old books that are, look, see, it even, they even printed the old foxing in there. It's what I would call facsimile copies of things. They work, they work, they sell pretty good, right? They're, it, it's, I just find some weird things where they're like reproductions of these facsimile copies, something I like to look for. Uh, technical books. Technical books and textbooks are tough. I come from an engineering background, so it's like there are things that I like in technical books that I always have good success with. Things that are like on anything on radar, old vacuum tubes, you know, for old like radio science type things. Um, vibrational analysis, computational fluid dynamics, um, I mostly, I think I said radar, antennas, um, high speed um, and low speed for that matter, <laughs> viscous flow, aircraft's uh, stability. Um, here's an example, you know, one that's, that's antennas for radar and communication. I just know this kind of stuff and I know that, well, I know what the real textbooks cost and there's, there's volumes, but in textbooks a lot of times are tricky, especially the older ones because they can still be, a value or they can be worth nothing, right? Because they get dated. 
So one thing I always do on textbooks is if, if, if I, you know, do a comp on your textbooks and just see, you know, look it up on eBay, look it up on Amazon and see. But one thing that I find oftentimes on textbooks, especially the real old stuff from like the 40s and 50s and 60s, if the author was um, like an MIT, Caltech, um, Stanford, Georgia Tech, um, then a lot of times, even though it's an old book, maybe from the 50s or 60s, sometimes those are, are seminal works. They are like cornerstone works that people like to get to get the original derivations and things from. So when in doubt, if I can't find anything on it, you know, I look and, and if the, the author was, you know, like I said, Caltech, MIT, Georgia Tech, Stanford, something like that, not to say the other schools aren't awesome too, but um, those, that's a good indication that there's probably good value in this, right? So that's, I don't know, I tried to give you, uh, there's, there's probably more exhaustive list that maybe there's a more cogent way to do this, but what I wanted to impress upon you is that in all those cases, there's nothing special about that specific title. Now, yes, it's stuff. I've, these are all things I bought that I'm going to sell, and I think they're of value. But what I approached it as is I approached it as learning broad spectrum genre things that I've learned over time that sell. Um, the probably some things I left off sports. Sometimes there's things on uh, like football, baseball teams, like team things. So that's you know sports is a good genre. Art and music, sometimes, you know, that's a tough one because art books, a lot of times, coffee table books, I, I sold some on quilting not too long ago that I got like $200 for, but a lot of times you'll see them and you can't even get $5 for them, right? Um, you know, the, the there's always other things. And, you know, on the fiction side, one genre I will say that I, that I sell a lot of and that I collect a lot of in fiction is science fiction. And especially vintage stuff, it's almost a no-brainer. But anytime I can find science fiction at a good price and lots of, you know, I can do it as book lots or something, I, I buy science fiction too. So anyway, hopefully that gives you something to think about, right? If nothing else, I know it's not, we could talk hours on this subject, it, but it's the, the concept of when I go in and I'm trying to use my eye, I'm trying to use my brain and I'm culling through books by looking at hardback nonfiction, weird subject matter, you know, that's, that's like my overriding thing. See cool, buy cool. I want weird hardback nonfiction. And I, I love to, to look at small publishers, but I'll buy anything, but then I've learned genres. And that's my advice to you is kind of let that steer you. Hopefully it'll cut down on some of the churn and some of the, you know, allow you to focus and, maybe get to the winner, winners, not the winners, get to the winners quicker. And, and the bottom line is make it where you can find books that are value for resale that'll let you sell them quicker, make better profit. Anyway, that's, that's my thoughts on it. Again, <laughs> the caveat is there, just as I've said, there are lots of ways to do this. This is how I do it. And, um, just see cool by cool. Hey, if you hadn't subscribed, if you're still having to be watching this at this point and you hadn't subscribed, hit the subscribe button and uh, keep coming back. Long time viewers, long time subscribers. Thank you for the channel support. You, you guys go keep watching. You keep, you know, watching the content. Uh, I enjoy doing it. Hopefully it helps and um, I'll keep making them. We'll see what happens. So we'll talk to you soon. Bye.